So for next time, we're going to be doing um, the major text from the other part of lyrical ballads. So we'll be looking at Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Um, and there'll be another vocab quiz this weekend, but just make sure you get that done by Sunday. I'll send out email reminders again. Um, and uh, yeah, um, as far as the reading quizzes are concerned, um, everybody will get those back. Uh, when everybody has taken them. There are a couple of people who have to make up quizzes. Um, so once that's all done, then I'll get them back to everyone. Uh, so does anybody have any questions about anything before we get started? Alright, uh, what do you all think of William Wordsworth? Very nature. Okay. <laughs> what do you mean by nature? What's nature-y about this? Like the mountains and the springs. Okay. And forests. Yep, mountains, springs, forests. Yeah, and then does he seem to be dwelling on nature for the whole poem? Y'all notice what he moves to when he's kind of done talking about nature? What is talking about nature leading into? Yeah, that's where he ends up at the end, right? We find out there's actually another person there with him to whom he's apparently addressing all of this, right? It's his sister. But what's going on in the middle, in between that nature description and the address to his sister? emotional states, right? So, um, really good picking up on all that, guys, actually. Like, usually I have to do a lot more um, coaching and drawing that out of the class to get it. Um, but yeah, what we're actually seeing in this poem is a familiar romantic poetic pattern. Um, in fact, it's familiar in part because, you know, Wordsworth starts, or is one of the ones who starts this particular kind of pattern, right? So. One of the um, dominant thinkers in the study of Romanticism in the 20th century is a guy named M. H. Abrams. Um, he was you know, a longtime professor of English at Cornell. Um, you know, died in 2012 at uh, the age of 102. Uh, was still publishing almost up until the end, um, and was the founding editor of this particular series of anthologies. Right, so. Abrams is a kind of big deal in English studies. Um, but one of the things he's, one of his, the accomplishments he's best known for is a book that he published in the early 50s called The Mirror and the Lamp. And the basic argument of The Mirror and the Lamp is a kind of about like what he thinks separates the romantic writers and artists from the neoclassicists who came before, right? So it might be a little while, it might be a little while now in our past here, but do we remember anything about what neoclassicism looked like, what neoclassicist writers were concerned with? Or What's that? Or Order, yes, form and order, good. What else? Anything else y'all remember? They were conservative. Yeah, they, t they tended to be fairly conservative. Um, you know, maybe not what we would call politically conservative, but definitely conservative in terms of like artistic form, artistic ideas, right? Um, a lot of neoclassical poetry, kind of to us, if we're not trained in its particular codes, kind of looks the same. Um, 
What was their attitude towards superstition? Does anybody remember towards superstition, magic, elves, trolls, wizards, all that shit? Did not like it, yes. Not one bit. They were anti-superstition and fantasy. What, did, what kind of subject matter did they tend to prefer, if you all remember? What did they prefer to write about? against neoclassicism. That kind of comes a little bit before romanticism. So the neoclassicists were mostly interested in urban social life. And on the whole, neoclassical art was about imitation. Right? On the one hand, you learned to be a poet by imitating the work of other poets before you could find your own original um, you also kind of you imitated the world around you, particularly the social world around you, in the poetry you produced. And the poetic modes that you used imitated Greek and Roman genres and hierarchies of genres, right? So for Abrams, neoclassicism is what he calls the mirror, right? The mirror is art that is primarily concerned with presenting a kind of imitation of the world, right? So what Abrams calls mimesis, which is a Greek word that simply means imitation, right? Now, the lamp then, in the mirror and the lamp, is romanticism. And we haven't really talked about romanticism yet, so I don't expect you all necessarily to know that much about it. But um, those of you who maybe have had other classes where you've talked about romanticism or maybe read some romantic poetry in high school, do you all remember anything about it? by your silence, the answer is, generally speaking, no. OK. So romanticism is often associated with kind of like nature poetry and the natural world and rural life, right? Though I'm going to illustrate in a minute that that's not what it's really about. Um, <clears throat> the romantics tend to be, on the whole, pro-superstition and fantasy. Uh, for example, when we read The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner next time, um, it's essentially um, a kind of ghost story in verse. So the supernatural absolutely good and fine with them. Um, and they're not so much concerned with social life as they are with the inner life of the individual. And rather than imitation, they are concerned very much with originality. It's from the romantics that we get the um, I think often wrong-headed assumption that all works of art are expressions of the author's soul somehow, right? Uh, yeah, Jordan, what do you say? So a lot of the work is introspective. Yeah, that's really the key thing that marks off romanticism from what's going on in other periods, right? Is this focus on the inner life of the individual. What romantic poetry is really about is not nature, it's about thought.
So the lamp for Abrams is the idea that the artist's soul, thoughts, ideas, whatever, illuminate the world rather than simply imitating it, right? Rather than simply kind of reflecting it back. Does this make sense, everybody? Everybody with me? Okay. So, Tintern Abbey and poems like it belong to a kind of subgenre that Abrams calls the greater romantic lyric. And this is essentially a kind of pattern in poems that we see both in the older generation of romantics like Wordsworth and Coleridge and Robert Southey, and also in the younger generation of romantics that includes um, John Keats, Percy Shelley, and Lord Byron. Right? And it's essentially a kind of outside, inside, outside movement. So first, And this is where I think we get the confusion that um, romanticism is about nature. It's really not, right? It's, the poem usually starts with observation of the poet's external environment. Oftentimes, it's a natural environment, especially an extreme natural environment, uh, because rom the romantics tend to be attracted to the sublime. But it doesn't have to be. There are also romantic, the romantic lyrics that start in a city or in a social group or something like that, right? The poem is then going to move inside as these observations spur kind of self-examination on the part of the poet. Right? The poet observes, you know, say a mountain or a stream or you know the river walk around Tintern Abbey and it gets, them, it gets them thinking, right? Reflecting. And then finally, we move outside again, in which the results of this self-examination are somehow shared or applied. And we see this pattern more or less perfectly represented in Tintern Abbey, right? We start with this observation of the tourist walk along the Y River Valley and the physical features of that landscape, which gets Wordsworth thinking about his personal history, both with this place, with nature generally, um, you know, and with um, experiences of you know, extreme um, sensory pleasure and emotion, right? And then he applies those reflections to his sister, right? He shares that with this other person who's walking with him and you know, tries to kind of see things afresh through her eyes, right? Okay, so anybody have any questions about this? Okay. So is there anything else y'all observed about this poem, or anything else you found particularly interesting about it? Or confusing, even? Oh, no, I found it interesting how you started it off. Okay. Um, it was like five years. 
summers and then you said five long winters. Like it almost seems to like express how much, like how long it felt to him. Yeah, Stre stretching out this five years, right? Do, do we all get what the five years he's talking about is? Where the hell is the Dan Rosser? There's always something missing in this room. Okay, so what, what are these five years he's talking about? Since he had last been in Abbey? Yeah, so the, what, one thing that this is telling us is that he's been here before, right? first time he's done this walk. So just to give you a little bit of background on Wordsworth and what he was doing in those intervening five years, right? So as a young man, Wordsworth uh, had a great deal of sympathy for the French Revolutionary cause. And before he went over to France, to live for a few years. He did this tourist walk along the Wide River Valley, the same one that he describes in the poem. And then he is coming back to the same place, carrying with him all of these other experiences, right? So he is a different and older person now than he was when he first came and did this particular walk, right? You know, he, was, he first first took the tour when he was 22, and now he's coming back at the age of 27. So why, yeah, why don't we just kind of continue here, kind of through the poem, and just pick some of the stuff apart. And you know, I'll kind of like give you background stuff as it becomes relevant, OK? All right, so can I get actually one of you to continue? So for, uh, just start, start from the beginning here. Five years have passed. Summers with the limbs of five long winters, and again I hear these waters rolling from the mountain springs in the soft inland river. Once again do I behold these deep and lofty cliffs, that on a wild secluded sea that press, thoughts of more deep seclusion, and connect the landscape of the fire of the sky. The day is come when I again propose, here under this dark sycamore, and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard chops, which at this season with their unripe are clad in one green view, and lose themselves, mid groves and boxes. Once again I see these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines, supporting the wood run wild. These pastoral farms, green to the very door, and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. With some uncertain notice, as might seem, of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or some hermit's cave, whereby his fire the hermit sits upon. Okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> In this first verse paragraph here, right, so we've already kind of teased out that this is referring in part to the relating past to present, right? And what is his, what do you notice about his experience of this? What sorts of things does he seem to be picking up on and most interested in? He seems really interested in the world around him Okay, yeah. He talks about these wreaths of smoke, right? Yeah. Good. How quiet and secluded everything is. Everything's quiet and secluded. Yeah. So let's see, I think about words here that relate to these other ideas, right? So we've got these wreaths of smoke, right? Where does he think they're coming from? Or where does he claim they're coming from? Dwellers in the woods and little pastoral farms, right? Yeah, so he's got these, this idea that the smoke is coming from woodland cottages. And from what he calls little pastoral farms. So if we think about these woodland cottages and like little pastoral farms, like in relation to the broader kind of forest landscape here, right? How invasive is that? Does this seem to be something that like kind of breaks up the natural landscape or kind of coexists peacefully with it? 
yeah, it's kind of human life in harmony with nature, right? Not really making uh, too big a foot, like not too big a footprint, right? Although the smoke is a clear evidence of some kind of carbon footprint here, right? Of some kind of human habitation, it seems to be a relatively gentle one, right? Now, this idea of quiet and seclusion, the new point of that what what makes this all seem quiet and secluded? Can we pick out a theme there? Or Yeah, the water's running. Okay, yeah, the waters the waters are running with a soft inland murmur, right? So a lot of the sounds here are relatively gentle. Even as the cliffs themselves are steep and steep and lofty, right? So we have a mixture here of the beautiful and the sublime. What else makes it seem quiet and secluded? Because it a wild secluded scene. Yeah, it's a wild secluded scene. Anything else that speaks to um, quiet or loneliness or seclusion? A hermit? Yeah. Or he sits alone? Yeah. Is the, now, is the hermit actually there, or is he just imagining the hermit? Imagine. Yeah, this, this is a, some imaginary hermit sitting in a cave in the woods, right? And by the way, I do want to point out, too, this first verse paragraph is the reason why I was playing Stairway to Heaven at the beginning of class, in part because the band drew a lot of the lyrics for that song, particularly from this first part of Wordsworth poem, Wordsworth's poem. Uh, for reasons that we'll probably draw out a little bit more next time uh, when we talk about Coleridge, heavy metal bands love romantic poetry. Um, it's kind of a, it's a huge influence on particularly 70s and 80s metal. Um, and I think, yeah, it'll become a little bit more clear why when we get to Coleridge. But yeah, Led Zeppelin drew a lot of lyrical content from this particular poem for that song. I remember playing that song um, in the band that I was in in high school. And because I was the drummer, I was just kind of literally sitting there through half the song, just kind of waiting. It's like, can I play it? Can I play it? I still feel a little twinge of relief when the drums kick in <laughs> every time I hear it. It's like, oh, good, I'm not, I'm not waiting. Um, but yeah, so we've got this hermit imagined out in the woods, right? So this is the kind of scene he sets for us. Right? What, if you had to associate a color with this scene, by the way, what might it be? primary color that covers all of this. Green. Yeah. I think we can also connect the green here, right, to the unripe fruits. What does it mean for a fruit to be unripe? Yeah, it's not matured yet, right? So it's still right, full of potential, right? If you bite into that apple now, it's going to be hard and sour. But if you give it another couple of weeks, it's going to be really juicy and sweet, right? So kind of sit on that, keep that in mind for the end of the poem, right, as we're talking about ripening potential. But I think one thing that I do want to show you here is what the Wye River Valley actually looked like at the time Wordsworth wrote this poem. And where those reefs of smoke he talks about were probably actually coming from. And I have been promised that this works now, so let's hope that it does. Thank 
happening. Lights on. Okay. Something's going to focus here. But weirdly, not the image that I'm trying to show you. Okay. It's only given us the bottom of the screen for some reason. Okay. So I guess I'm just going to have to tell you. <laughs> what have seen like, showing you. Wait, I think you might have to like, drag it over. Drag it over? Uh, what do you mean? Hold the top of the page and drag it to the right. Oh, hey. What the hell? Who designed this crazy nonsense? Okay. I can't see it on this anymore, but y'all can see it on that. <laughs> okay. So thank you, Jordan, for helping me figure that out. Um, so this is what most of the Y River Valley would have actually looked like. So the Y River runs kind of along the border of England and Wales. Wordsworth would have been walking on the English side of the river. But this was an area that was heavily, on the one hand, it was heavily industrialized. So there wouldn't have been really all that many little secluded places where imaginary hermits can hide out. And most of those wreaths of smoke coming up through the trees would have come from factory chimneys. Plus there would have been boats going up and down the river and probably other walkers along the tour. So this is probably much less secluded than Wordsworth describes it as, right? And yeah, that's the other thing to note here is that this was a really popular spot for walking tours. In fact, it was so popular that um, certain entrepreneurs set up these kinds of um, viewing prospects of what they called picturesque settings. One of them being, I were over here. Can we drag that over too? Yeah, I, neither do I. <laughs> I think it's under display somehow. It's something about like two screen ones. Oh, it's okay. It's probably got it on. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, let me see. Yeah, let me, maybe I can fix that now. Rather than continuing to. Tintern Abbey would have looked like as viewed from one of these prospects, right? And these prospects, yeah, were set up to give you a kind of frame through which to look at these kinds of sublime landscapes, right? So when we talk about the sublime, do we remember what that meant? What the sublime was always concerned with? Yeah, so when we talk about the sublime, we're talking about the aesthetics of awe or terror. 
And what the picturesque is, it's kind of late 18th, early 19th century way of framing the sublime to allow you to experience it in a way that is not particularly frightening, right? So if you're looking at something like this great big old ruined abbey, which might fill you with awe if you walked up close to it, like from a distance and above, right? Then it beautifully frames a nice little picture for you. So this is the kind of thing that was all over a tourist walk like this. And in fact, the Y Valley is the subject of the first ever illustrated travel book published in Britain. Uh, it's written by a guy named William Gilman. It's called Observations on the River Walk, published in 1782. So this is the context in which Wordsworth is making this particular trip, right? And he's erasing certain important parts of that context, right? He's erasing um, the industrialism in the area, and he's erasing the other tourists. And the fact that all of these views are kind of set up to look pretty specifically by people who want you to pay money to sit and to stand and look in the prospects. So he's removed any industrial, commercial, or human interest in large part from this area. Okay, so let's continue on with the poem here and see where we get to. Can somebody uh, start reading for us from this, these beauteous forms? These beauteous forms, through a long absence, have not been to me as is a landscape to a body man's eye. But oft in lonely rooms, amid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them in hours of weariness, sensations sweet, felt in the blood and felt below the heart, and passing even into my pure mind, with tranquil restriction. Feelings, too, of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best portion of a good man's life. These little nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love, nor less I trust to them I may have owed another gift, to ask my poor sublime, than that blessed mood in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of, of all this unintelligible world is lightened. That serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost is said that we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. All right, thank you. So are we still standing with him along the banks of the River Wye, looking at hedgerows and unripe fruits and murmuring rivers and steep cliffs? What are we getting now instead? What, what, what have we moved into here? if we're looking at this in terms of this greater romantic lyric pattern. This self-examination. Yeah, this is the beginning of that self-examination process, right? So he's described his external environment, and now he's processing it internally, right? So I don't know if you, if, did, any, um, did any of you take a minute uh, to read the excerpts from the preface to Lyrical Ballads? Um, it's okay if you didn't. You know, I recommend it, but didn't uh, command you to read it. Um, the reason I wanted you to have a look at it was because uh, it's uh, Wordsworth. This is where Wordsworth kind of describes his poetic process. Now, one thing to note is that he's describing the process of writing a poem like Tintern Abbey four years after he actually wrote it. So it's all retrospective. But if we look on page uh, 314, can I get one of you to start reading with, I have said that poetry is a spontaneous overflow. I 
you've said that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion, collective, and tranquility. The emotion is contemplated so by a species of reaction, the tranquil tranquility gradually disappears, and an emotion kindred to that which was before the subject of contemplation is gradually produced, and does itself actually exist in the mind. Okay, thank you. So this is probably the most important sentence in the whole essay. So what is he saying about what it takes here to write a poem? Can you, so what is the basis for a poem? What do you need to write? What's the first thing you need to write a poem? Need to have feelings. Yeah, you, it's, you're, you're, you're trying to process, right, some powerful emotion into art. But does he seem to think you can do that while you are still feeling that emotion? What do you have to do in order to make this emotion into a poem? Or what do you need in order to make this emotion into a poem? Does it contemplate it and think through it? Yeah, exactly. Right? You know, emotion recollected in tranquility, right? So you've got to get yourself into a calm and peaceful state someplace where you can think about what you felt and try to put it into words, right? idea here, the thing that a poet is aiming to do is to um, how do I want to phrase this? Um, when we think back to um, what we talked about last time, we talked about Olga and Rihanna, right? Do you remember that process of defamiliarization? Um, what, was, uh, what, what was that all about? What was, what was Equiano trying to do by defamiliarizing ordinary objects. Like appeal to the sensibility of people? Yeah, he was trying to appeal to his reader's sensibility, sure, in a very specific way here, right? Why would he, like, why would he describe, for example, snow in the way that he does? What's he trying to illustrate to the reader specifically? And he doesn't know what it is. Yeah, that he doesn't know what it is, right? And so he's trying to show you what it feels like, right, to experience something like that for the first time. So, you know, the, something like snow that is perfectly familiar to your average Englishman, right, to a Nigerian, right, looks weird, looks like salt. So what he's trying to show people is you know, these things that are how, how these things that are perfectly normal to them look to people who've never experienced them. What Wordsworth wants to do in poetry is something really closely related to this. He wants you to look at the kinds of things that habit teaches you to ignore or to take for granted, and to look at them with fresh eyes and to try to experience them again for the first time. And I think that's one of the reasons why in this poem, he starts by framing it in terms of past experience, right? That this is a place that isn't new to him anymore, and that will never be new to him again. But who is it new to? It might be new to the reader, right? But is there somebody even closer to the reader? Or even closer to him than the reader? His sister. Yeah, his sister who he speak to whom he's speaking, right? This is her first time taking this tour. So can we go to page 301 here? We'll go back to the rest of the middle of the poem in a minute, um, you know, and try to tease some of that out. But let's 
talk about like what he's doing here with his sister Dorothy, right? So can, uh, can I get somebody to read from Nor Perchance, the bottom of page 301. Nor Perchance, if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my gentle spirits to decay. For thou art when you appear upon the bank of this fair river, that my dearest friend, my dear and my friend, and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart. And if it be my former pleasures and the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. Okay, so let's pause here for a second, right? And then we'll come back to the we'll come back to the rest of this, right? So, what is he noticing by observing her as they take this walk? What does he see in her? He sees her like one of the eyes that she's taking the long way. Yeah, he sees, yeah, he see, yeah, he's watching her, what he calls her wild eyes, right? But why is he taking so much particular pleasure? in watching her take all this in. What does this allow him to experience? Yeah, it's a way to relive vicariously that first experience of seeing this place, right? It's like, I can't have that again, but I can recapture what it was like by watching you go through it. Right? by observing your reactions. And so this is kind of one thing to note about Wordsworth. Right? So we mentioned how romantic poetry tends to be about you know, individual subjectivity anyway, right? But Wordsworth never really seems to write about anything but himself, um, which um, can be a little bit fucking irritating. One gets a little tired of Wordsworth's company after a while. Um, but <clears throat> in this particular poem, I think it is actually particularly effective, right? Um, you know, he is thrilled by watching his sister relive his old impressions, right? In fact, what is the what, what's the next sentence right after the part where he stopped? Right after that wild eyes, what does he say? He seeing that he was. Yeah. Oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I was once. So by observing her, right, he's looking back on a past self that he feels like he's lost. And so this last long verse paragraph of the poem, right, this is that outside part that we were talking about, right? This is the lamp. This is the poet taking all the results of this self-examination that he's been doing and shining it outward onto something else, right? In this case, his sister. All right, so let's continue with this. Can I get somebody to keep reading from my dear, dear sister? My dear, dear sister, in this prayer I make, knowing that nature never gave you try, the heart that loved her, tis her privilege, through all the years of this our life to me, from joy to joy, for she can so inform the mind that it's within us, so impressed with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts and youth that neither evil tongues. Rash judgments nor the sneers of selfish men, or greetings, or no kindnesses, or all the dreary intercourse of daily life, shall ear prevail against us, or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we believe is full of blessings. Okay, let's pause here again, for because there's a, there's an opposition here that Wordsworth is setting up in this part of the verse part of the paragraph. Can we tell what two things he's setting up against each other? Good, yes.
Now, can any of you think of a reason why he might be doing this? Or where he might be getting this idea from, of nature and society as kind of opposed forces? Yeah, that seems to be the reading here, right? Yeah, nature good, society bad, right? There was a cartoon I used to watch when I was in high school. It was called The Animaniacs, and there was a, they would have this little sketch. It was called Good Idea, Bad Idea, and you know, it would always be like, you know, good idea, whistling while you work, bad idea, whistling while you I'm not sure that's absolutely that's actually relevant, but the good bad thing just kind of got me got me thinking of that. Um, yeah, okay, so does anybody know where, like, where the idea that nature is good and society bad is society is bad might be coming from in the late 18th century? Especially given those neoclassicists, right? Generally thought society good or at least interesting, and nature relatively uninteresting. I'm just going to put a name on the board, and y'all tell me if any of you have heard of this guy before. Okay, you're not you're not in Jordan. You have heard of Jean Jacques Rousseau. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, so Rousseau, for those of you who don't know him, is a late 18th century Swiss philosopher. And what do you know about Rousseau's ideas, Jordan, that might be relevant that might be relevant to what we're talking about? That he also talked about himself, like words. Okay. <laughs> Rousseau also talked obsessively about himself, and right? Yes. He was very introspective about his mm -hmm. feelings. Yeah. And that how his past experiences affected him later on in life. Yeah, that's the, the whole he's, he writes kind of like the first modern memoir, or right? the first modern autobiography. And it's yeah, primarily about you know, like applying the fruits of his experience, right, in all their um, ugly, uh, sometimes really ugly details. He tells us a lot of things about himself that we probably don't want to know. But the reason why he's relevant, particularly here, is that he is making he makes essentially the same argument, you know, before Wordsworth does it here, right? That nature is kind of good and pure and innocent, and that living in society corrupts the human spirit. So this is an idea that animates particularly a lot of early European romanticism. That society is essentially a bad influence on people who are naturally good and would continue to be good if simply left alone. And I think, yeah, we get a sense of that when he's talking here about um, you know, evil tongues, rash judgments, the sneers of selfish men, right? The kinds of things that they, you know, that, that they would encounter you know, if they were back in town. But out here, on the White River Valley, where apparently there are no other people, even though there are actually lots of other people walking up and down the river at the same time, um, they can just ignore all that shit, right? All right, so can we continue here then from, uh, therefore let the moon shine on me. Therefore let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk, and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow man's thee, and in, year, in after years when these wild ecstasies shall be matured and consume her pleasure, then thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, Thy memory be at the dwelling place for all sweet songs and harmonies. O oh, then, if solitude or fear or pain or grief shall be thy portion, then what healing thoughts of tender joy will our remember me? And these my exhortations, mm -hmm. more perchance, if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past experience. Wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together, and that I, so long the worshiper of nature, hither came unwearied in that service, rather say with warmer love, O oh, with far deeper zeal, full your love. Nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings, many 
years of absence, these deep woods and lofty cliffs. And this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake. So, first thing I want to know here, what color does he return to at the end of the poem here? Green. Back to green, right? So, the sister here is now associated with the color green as well, right? So what does that suggest about the way he's thinking of her and her first experience of the Wide Valley Tour? That she hasn't had time to mature Yeah, that she's still full of all this potential growth, right? That this is a, you know, all kind of potential food for you. And, you know, to put some of this into perspective, too, Dorothy is only a year younger. Um, though, as a woman, her um, her opportunities to experience the world were, were a little bit less, uh, or a, little, a bit more constrained um, than her brothers. And we'll talk more directly about her experiences a week from today when we look at some of her journals. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, he's looking here, here as his, his sister as a figure of potential, right? Potential inspiration, potential creativity, potential spiritual growth, right? What else is going on in, at the end of the poem here? What, what else do you like? How, how else does he seem to be regarding her? Apart from you know, like the source of potential. We see that whole spontaneous overflow of emotion recollected in tranquility thing again. He says, in after years when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into the sober pleasure, right? Kind of like taming these wild feelings into something more manageable. But then what about these lines here? When thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies. And she's like so far into society to like remember that to that place. Yeah, that all of this can then be a kind of source of strength, right? When you're back in that um, that nasty, vicious social world, right? Your mind can be a can essentially become a storehouse full of these kinds of sustaining images. Oh, then if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me? And peace my exhortations, right? So bringing everything back to himself again, because that's just what he does. Um, what else do y'all think of this? context stuff that I want to give to y'all, but um, before I do that, I kind of want to know if there's anything else that, if there's any place you want to go here that we haven't really explored. Like, okay. Like 95 to like 105-ish. Okay. Starting with like uh, like a sense sublime of something far more deeply infused. Mm -hmm. Whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and the mind of man. A motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains. And of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they have created and what perceive, well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anger of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul, of all my moral being. 
So there's a couple, there are a couple of things I can say about this, but I think first, uh, Savannah, I want to know like why the, why you were drawn to this particular passage. Was it just the, the color imagery, or was there something else going on there? It was kind of the color because he's focused on green three times now, but then, I mean, obviously yeah. the sky is blue, but like he mentioned that, and mm -hmm. I didn't know if it was like, like he was trying to play off something. Yeah, I think there is still that idea with the green earth, right? It's this kind of source of fertility and potential, right? Um, but I think a lot of what's going on around here, too, like, you, are any of you familiar with the term pantheism? Do any of you know what this means? Okay, if I broke this down for you and translated the Greek into English, and said pan means something like all or everything. And theism comes from the Greek theos, which means God. Can you, fit, can you make the connection? Can you figure out what that means? Sort of. It's less about being created by and more about being contained within. So pantheism means essentially everything is God. God is in everything. And this is a fairly common, uh, it's not a common viewpoint in late 18th century Britain, but it is common among late 18th century and early 19th century British Romantic poets, right? This notion that there's like a, there's a divine spark in everything around us, right? That essentially God is nature. And so that's part of what's happening here. The other thing that he's doing here in this part of the poem is Essentially, like help, the kind of outlining part of his theory of imagination, there, right? So, therefore, am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains, and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and half perceive? So, if he's talking about the world of eye and ear. How might we translate that into non-poetry language? What's he talking about if he's talking about the world of eye and ear? The world of society, or the human. Um, he actually means something different by this. And let's, if we think about this in terms of stuff we've already been talking about, like say, sensibility. What do your eye and your ear have in common? Sense. Yeah, exactly. They're both kind of receptors for sense impressions, right? So when he talks about the world of eye and ear, what he's talking about is the world of sense impressions. Both what they have create and what perceive. So your senses, according to Wordsworth here, don't just perceive the world around you. They also have created, right? They have a creative function as well. So what he's coming to is something kind of close to what, we call, what, what Coleridge will work into a theory of the imagination. which I'm putting in all caps because this is something that the romantics often do, putting this whole idea in all caps, right? So for Coleridge, the imagination is about as close to the power of God as human beings get, right? Imagination is our ability to take our sense impressions and melt them down into new forms, right? So there's a difference between what 
the Romantics refer to as fancy, which is just a form of memory, right? You can take things you've directly experienced and you know rearrange them, uh, you know, sort of place them in a different. Like for example, it's not that hard for someone who has experienced a zoo, right, to then write a poem about a circus. All you're doing is taking more or less the same sense impressions and rearranging them slightly, right? However, what someone who is using the imagination does is you take some of the animals in that zoo, right? Say you take a goat and a horse, and you melt those impressions together into a unicorn, right? Then you're using the imagination, right? you are using your senses to create something that has not been seen before. And Wordsworth doesn't go quite as far down this road as Coleridge will, but one thing that we have to uh, bear, and I think this is where the context I want to talk about comes in, is that these two poets were in very, very close collaboration at this time, right? And in fact, this poem first appeared in a book that they wrote together. So, by the time this poem appears in 1798, Wordsworth is already an established poet. He's published two collections. Descriptive sketches and Evening Walk, both of which appeared in 1793 when he's only 22 years old. But they don't make much of an impression, except on another young poet, two years younger than Wordsworth by the name of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who we have already met in a couple of different contexts here. So the two of them meet for the first time in 1795. And by 1797, they are living near each other and collaborating. a slim volume of poems that appears in 1798 called Lyrical Ballads. Wordsworth is responsible about two-thirds of the content of the volume. Coleridge the remaining third, although Coleridge's um, contributions are on the whole much longer. Coleridge only contributes four poems, but they're pretty beefy poems. Most of Wordsworth's are shorter. And they kind of divide up the subject matter as well. So Wordsworth writes poems of rural about rural life, and Coleridge writes poems about ghosts and vampires and zombies and shit. And <clears throat> the volume is animated by a couple of principles that for the time are revolutionary. So on the one hand, both poets at this time had democratic and pro-revolutionary that is kind of French revolutionary sympathies. So this kind of like leads to their interest um, in 
the lives and language of ordinary people and in things like folk beliefs and folk forms. In fact, the whole idea of lyrical ballads is about taking um, a, poet a folk poetic form, the ballad, which was not highly regarded uh, by critics or by scholars, and trying to elevate it into um, something that more serious readers uh, would be interested in, would take seriously, would respect. Right? So <clears throat> they are also both, at this time, pantheist, more or less, in their religious beliefs. That kind of runs through the whole volume. And they're also, they're both reading and commenting on each other's poems and sharing ideas um, as, they're, as they're working. Right? So there are parts of some of Wordsworth's poems that are actually written by Coleridge. And there are parts of even, you know, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which we're going to look at next time, which were written or suggested uh, by Wordsworth, even though the poem is credited to so this whole time, they, they really are, you know, they're working very, very closely with each other. And the basic idea was that Wordsworth was going to be the poet, and Coleridge was going to be the, the philosopher and the theorist, right? So the first edition doesn't really make much of an impact. It just kind of it appears and vanishes. But subsequent editions in 1800 and 1802, um, fall into the right hands. Um, there's a, a line about um, an album from the late 60s by a group called The Velvet Underground. It's like only a thousand people bought the album, but every one of them started a band. Uh, you can kind of think of lyrical ballads as being kind of like the, the poetic equivalent of that, right? It gets into the hands of a lot of young poets and is a profound influence on them. All right, so that's about all I have for you on all this stuff. Does anybody have any questions about me over today? Everybody good? Everybody get the phone? Excellent. Okay, so let me give you the guide questions for next time. If I'm being perfectly honest, I usually find Coleridge a little bit more fun than I find Wordsworth. Um, but again, you know, I did mention, like, you know, Ghosts and zombies and shit, so it's a different, uh, a different realm. Okay, and make sure that this actually appears on the screen.